Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. It's Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. Donald Trump's Florida residence, Mar-a-Lago, was raided by federal police in an unprecedented politically motivated investigation. The war in Ukraine, under fresh scrutiny, after reports of Ukrainian soldiers using civilians as human shields and U.S. weapons ending up on the black market. Also, Trump reiterates intention of abolishing the Federal Department of Education. And the inflation exacerbation bill passes along party lines. We're talking about all this. More coming up right now. So Trump says FBI searched a state in major escalation of probe in this AP article by Eric Tucker and Michael Balsamo. So the lead in the AP article, the FBI searched Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate as part of an investigation into whether he took classified records from the White House. People familiar with the matter said it was a move that represents a dramatic and unprecedented escalation of law enforcement scrutiny over a former president. This has really never happened before. From the Washington Examiner, Trump disqualified from holding office? Clinton-linked lawyer points to U.S. code after FBI raid. Now, most of us in the know already have figured out what they're trying to do is just bar Trump from running from office. So uh, the examiner writes, uh, with the news of FBI raiding Mar-a-Lago, buzz quickly bubbled up Monday evening about whether former President Donald Trump could be disqualified from holding office again. The FBI search of the Florida resort was related to Trump's handling of presidential records, including classified documents after leaving office. Such reporting had Mark Elias, a top lawyer for Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, who has drawn scrutiny for his role in pushing Trump-Russia collusion claims, pointing to U.S. Code Title 18, Section 2071, the media is missing the really, really big reason why the raid today is potentially a blockbuster in American politics. It is because they're trying to bar him from holding office again. That's the whole point of all these things and trying to indict him and whatnot. And Trump's pretty squeaky clean, so they can't really find anything So they go on this fishing expedition, and if they can't find anything related to these documents, they're sure to find something else, because apparently they took documents without even being sure what they were. And from the Hill, McCarthy threatens to probe Garland after Trump FBI raid. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy promised on Monday that if Republicans take back the chamber after November's midterm elections, they will investigate the Department of Justice telling Attorney General Merrick Garland to clear your calendar. McCarthy said, I've seen enough. The Department of Justice has reached an intolerable state of weaponized politicization. When Republicans take back the House, we will conduct immediate oversight of this department following the facts and leave no stone unturned. Attorney General, preserve your documents and clear your calendar, says McCarthy. We will see. So in the next story here, this is from CBS News. This is their initial article that was forced to retract. Why military aid in Ukraine may not always get to the front lines. And this is from August 7th. Editors note, this article has been updated to reflect changes since the CBS reports documentary Arming Ukraine was filmed in the documentary is also being updated. Jonas Oman says the delivery has significantly improved since filming with CBS in late April. The government of Ukraine notes that the U.S. Defense Attaché Brigadier General Garrick Harman arrived in Kiev in August 2022 for arms control and monitoring. So basically their documentary here um, and this article, which has been updated now, was stating that um, the U.S. weapons that were going to Ukraine we're not getting to the front lines and actually going on to the black market. Why? Is because Ukraine is notoriously corrupt. Notoriously. Not even, I'm not speculating and, and people just aren't, you know, Republicans or, or people that are against the war casting this around. 
Ukraine has been notoriously corrupt, even when Russia was control of Ukraine and the West took over Ukraine and they use it as a, a giant money laundering operation because they're corrupt. And so why, why is it not surprising that billions of dollars in equipment and, and cash go to Ukraine and it's not going where it's supposed to? Of course it's not. CBS, uh, excuse me, CNN even reported what happens to weapons sent to Ukraine. The U.S. really doesn't know. And this is again back in April referring to the CBS documentary. The U.S. has few ways to track the substantial supply of anti-tank, anti-aircraft and other weaponry it has sent across the border to Ukraine, sources tell CNN. A blind spot that's due in large part to the lack of U.S. boots on the ground in the country, and they're making a, a play for more U.S. troops, and the easily portable uh, portability of many of the smaller systems now pouring across the border. While any soldier that gets hand, their hands on some of this can easily put it in a truck, sell it to somebody on the black market, and make some money. This isn't surprising at all. From Business Insider, CBS partially retracts documentary that outraged Ukraine by claiming that the U.S. weapons shipments were going missing. CBS said it was updating the documentary that said most weapons sent to Ukraine don't reach the front. It admitted that it figured it cited claiming only 30% of military aid ar arrives was out of date. The documentary angered some of the Ukrainian government uh, and other people arming the Ukrainian government. CBS partially retracted the documentary in which it said that shipments of the weapons to Ukraine from the U.S. was going missing. And CBS tweeted yesterday that it had removed a video promoting the documentary that included a months-long quote of saying aid was not making it to the Ukraine's front lines. Wow, they were actually retracting actual reporting. And here it has a picture of it looks like Ukrainians, Ukrainian soldiers drilling outside wearing surgical masks. And from NPR, experts widely condemn Amnesty International report alleging Ukrainian war crimes. Ukrainian international experts, commenters, uh, experts and commenters have responded critically to an Amnesty International report implicating Ukrainian troops in potential war crimes. Um, I'm not going to go really much into the uh, NPR thing because you know they're just spinning this i've been telling you and there have been plenty of people on talk radio and talk radio and talk television all the talking heads that have already admitted this including the secretary of defense and then you have civilians and bomb shelters saying we're here with ukrainian soldiers um who are sheltering with civilians which is not allowed under uh, you know under the geneva convention so, and Russia has satellites, and so they can see troop movements. And so the only way to keep Ukrainian soldiers from being attacked is obviously through a sheltering in civilians and in schools and in hospitals, but they've been doing all of this. This is from CNBC. International, uh, Amnesty International report sparks Fuhrer resignation in Ukraine. The head of Interna uh, Amnesty International's Ukraine chapter has resigned after she opposed publishing a report that claimed forces exposed civilians to Russian attacks by basing themselves in populated areas. We've all known this. This is not, this is not even disputed. The head of international, uh, Amnesty International's Ukraine chapter has resigned, saying the human rights organization shot down her opposition to publishing a report that claimed Ukrainian forces had exposed civilians to Russian attacks by basing themselves in populated areas. That's why, and you had early on in the conflict, uh, the media reporting that uh, Ukrainians, uh, excuse me, Rus the Russian military was targeting civilians. They were. It, it's the fact that Ukrainian forces were staying in uh, civilian areas specifically to avoid Russian attack. And the Russians would attack and they'd kill civilians. They weren't specifically targeting civilians. They were targeting Ukrainian military who are hiding amongst the civilians. This has been going on since the beginning of the conflict. Why? Is because Russia has satellites and can see troop movements and easily target them. In a statement posted Friday on Facebook, this uh, Amnesty International person 
accused her former employer of disregarding Ukraine's wartime realities and concerns of local staff members who had pushed for the report to be reworked. It's painful to admit, and I and the leadership of Amnesty International have split over values. I believe that any work done for the good of society should take into account local context. Russia has repeatedly justified attack on civilian areas by alleging Ukrainian fighters had set up firing positions at the tar at the targeting locations. Of, of course, not only that, like I said, you had civilians in bomb shelters saying we're here with Ukrainian soldiers. This is Amnesty International, Ukraine, Ukrainian fighting tactics and danger civilians. This is the indeed the report. Ukrainian forces have put civilians in harm's way by establishing bases and operating weapon systems specifically anti-tank rifles and weapons um, in schools and hospitals and, and such. They have uh, establishing bases and operating weapon systems in populated residential areas, accusing, uh, including schools and hospitals, just like I said, and repelled the Russian invasion that began in February. Such tactics violate international humanitarian law and endanger civilians as they turn civilian objects into military targets and ensure ensuring ensuing Russian strikes in populated areas have killed civilians and destroyed. We all knew this. We all knew this, and when they were saying they're deliberately targeting civilians, you knew that wasn't true because that's a bad PR. So the media is actually helping along uh, this sort of spin that uh, the Russians were deliberately targeting civilians, and they even said that when the fact it wasn't the case and all the evidence was out there. Not surprising. So if any of you saw the Trump speech, um, I believe it was in Wisconsin, and I forget exactly where this last one was. Crowd cheers as Trump calls for the uh, abolition of the Department of Education. Former President Donald Trump called for the abolition of the U.S. Department of Education on Saturday. I know this was in Dallas. He spoke at the conservative, oh, that's right, it was at CPAC, Conservative Political Action Conference. And of course, at CPAC, people would cheer. And this isn't a new theme. The, Department, the Federal Department of Education doesn't do anything except allocate funds. They don't do any actual educating, and they try to outline certain uh, broad strokes, which is really the danger because it could become ideological uh, very quickly. Why Republicans have long wanted to Shut the Education Department. This is from the Chicago Tribune, and this is from 2018. In 2016, Fox host Sean Hannity asked Donald Trump if he would eliminate any federal departments if he were to become president. Trump responded by saying that the Department of Education is, a massive, is massive and it could be largely eliminated. And, they, and the uh, Tribune goes on to say, well, it's the smallest department, but it doesn't really do anything because most education is handled by the states and the smaller municipalities. This is the foundation for economic education. Reagan's goal to end the Department of Education is finally gaining momentum. Ending the Department of Education may seem like a radical idea, but it's not as crazy as it sounds by Patrick Carroll. And this is back from April the, and they go on in their lead to write uh, the debate over the federal role in education has been going on for decades. Some say the feds should have a relatively large role, while others say it should be relatively small. But while most people believe there should be at least some federal oversight, some believe that there should be none at all. Um, it's just the amount of funding that goes into the Department of Education. And Rep. Uh, Representative Thomas Massey is one who believes that it should be no federal involvement in education. He is actively working to make that a reality. In, in 21, uh, 2021, he introduced a bill, uh, House Resolution 899, uh, uh, perfectly encapsulate his views. The bill terminates the Department of Education. And like I said, it's a funding arm. It really doesn't do anything. Uh, from the New American, why Ronald Reagan couldn't abolish the Department of Education. This is from 2012. His predecessor, uh, the department was only set up in 79, if people didn't know, by Jimmy Carter. That was backed by the National Education Association um, by promising a cabinet-level Department of Education there was no popular demand for Federal Education Department. Education was not even mentioned in the Constitution. It has been the concern of states 
since the beginning of the Republic, but the NEA, anxious to get grubby hands on billions of federal dollars, has been agitating for the department for decades, and finally the Democrats, with the help of some Republicans, gave them what they wanted. So you can see it, it is exactly, like I said, it's a financing arm. It's not really about education at all. Moving on to other headlines, Senate passes um, the Inflation Exacerbation Act, um, it's just a federal spending bill, and most of it was the Build Back Better, the Green New Deal thing, um, billions of dollars for green energy, and we saw what happened with Solyndra. It doesn't, you're investing in green energy, which is great, but green energy uh, accounts for a small amount of the electricity generated. And people's power consumption has gone up while they're advocating to go uh, to to turn over almost completely to green energy, which which can't meet the power needs of most people. So what happens in that instance? Um, power, uh, the price of power and electricity goes up to such extent that common people can't afford it. And so they get shut out of the technological revolution because they can't afford uh, to access information on the internet mostly or on their phones or what have you. I mean, people talk all about air conditioning and that's all fine and good, but it's really about information. And MSN writes, uh, legislators advanced the bill after an all-night session in which voted on dozens of proposed amendments in a process known as Votorama, so they add things on in the end. The evenly sp split Senate and then Kamala Harris cackled as she had the bill go through. So this will exacerbate inflation, and you won't really see it till after the midterms. And this is a, a, uh, a strategy by Democrat, because people, it, it, if, as imagined, uh, the Republicans would get control of the House, they'll inherit this mess. And last story here, GOP tempers expectations for Senate majority. So the problem here in the Hill states that Republicans are looking to manage expectations when it comes to winning back the Senate majority in November as Democrats rack up key legislative wins. And they're not really wins. They're being billed as wins by the media, but they're not really, they're not really wins at all. Um, they're terrible. They're enacting more of the terrible policies that got us into the position we're in. National uh, Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee Chairman Rick Scott on Sunday acknowledged that it was going to be a hard year, and uh, I featured Rick Scott in yesterday's podcast when he was on Face the Nation, where they turned down his mic and made him look weak, and then uh, Maggie Brennan talked over him and then challenged him and all these things. When he said what was happening, which was more spending is going to worsen inflation and none of the things that they're doing in there is going to do anything to help average Americans. And he said, we have 21 Republicans up, only 14 Democrats, he said, on CBS Face the Nation. The Democrats are out raising us, but we'll have good candidates. And I believe Joe Biden is going to be our key here. Uh, you know, of course, it's Joe Biden. Everything is linked to him. He's a failing president. And um, the America, the MAGA First, the America First um, platform has got uh, some great candidates coming up and, and people want to see the country turn around because they believe it's on the right track. So that's not really surprising at all. You know, I don't think people are just, you know, economics involves math. People don't like math. They don't like thinking about how money is created and money as debt. And what, you know, I sh I, back when I woke up, I saw a short little video, money as debt, you should look it up. And how money is created, and that really shifted my whole political perspective. I became more conservative when I realized that when you debase the currency, to help other people, you're not helping anybody. You're ruining the economy. And that's exactly what they're doing. Rudy's Revelation. We'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow me on Facebook, Twitter. Get our minds. We'll see you tomorrow.